who not only gave a very inaccurate description of Dikran and his period, but portrayed the Armenian king as a grotesque caricature, ridiculed his feudal nature, and basically portrayed him as a monster. Such studies could be accepted as unreliable at best, especially since the material presented in them was very partial to and favored the Romans. They were Roman historians. Now we know, it's very well known, ask any ancient historian that studies in American universities, that Rome routinely and masterfully encouraged a biased historiography which focused on and exaggerated its military successes while keeping silent about historical facts which were not favorable to the Roman Republic. In fact, the very famous Roman historian, Jewish Roman historian, Josephus, who wrote the book on the, the Jewish wars, states that even eyewitness Roman accounts have a strong tendency to either alter the facts in Rome's favor or to praise the Romans while defaming the enemies. Unfortunately, most European scholars, Germans, Italians, a whole group of them, which I mentioned here in the book, totally ignore the evidence of Greek historians, historians of Asia Minor who were in that area. They also completely forget that many of these historians, especially the German historians of the period, Mommsen especially, have a terrible ant antipathy towards the entire Eastern people. They call the Eastern people, including the Armenians and all the people of the East, as dogs who are alike in fidelity and in falsehood. The Asiatic has a slave-like willingness to perform any executioner's office at the bidding of the ruler. So very negative look of generally Italian historians, German historians about this period. They view the whole area as a war between East and West. West being civilized, Rome, East being the uncivilized Eastern people, the Persians, the Armenians, are all put together. In reality, as Manandian shows and as new research shows, the wars that Rome started in this area had nothing to do with bringing democracy to these areas, had nothing to do with bringing culture, it was primarily for pillage and financial gain. The wars were not against barbarians in Armenia or in Iran or in Pontus, but actually Tigran, the kings of Pontus, were extremely educated Hellenistic rulers who wanted to expand trade, to build new cities, we have all this documented, and basically Rome came in and destroyed that entire Hellenistic civilization in that area by attacking Mesopotamia, what is today Iraq, Syria, Armenia, Pontus, devastating the cities, enslaving the population, and weakening it to such an extent, as you will see later, to facilitate the arrival of the Arabs into that area. Most historians now say, had Rome not done that, had Armenia and Pontus were permitted to create strong governments in that middle section, neither the Arabs and certainly not the Turks later on would have had such an easy time penetrating this corridor. Of course, this is a theory. Now, before I proceed, let's look at the history of Armenia in the time just before Tigra. Armenian dynastic history, yes, our, we have Urartu. After Urartu, we have the short period of the Yervandian ruling. But none of them were real kings, Armenian kings. Even though the Yervandians were Armenians, they were governors. The first Armenian kings that had crowns, separate crowns, and Armenia was a country with delineated borders, was the Artashesian dynasty. Artashes I was the Armenian king who, after Rome defeated 
the successes of Alexandria in what is today Western Turkey in the Battle of Magnesia. You see it on map number one in the corner. Rome established Roman Asia province, year 190 BC. It's a very famous battle, the Battle of Magnesia, in most history books. This is the battle that Rome defeated Seleucus, one of the successors of Alexander dynasty in that area, of Alexander the Great. Once Rome established itself there, and the Seleucids begin to go downhill, the dynasty, a new Iran emerges, a post-Alexandrian Iran, a post-Seleucid Iran. This Iran has a new dynasty, a new ruling group known as the Parthians in Armenia Parthev, the Parthev group, the Parthians, which as you know, later Gregory the Illuminator and many of them come from this area. Now, were they Parthian or not? Some say Gregory the Illuminator was part of Vahan Mamikonian, part of Mamikonian family came from there. It doesn't matter. Some say they came from China. That's important. The important thing is there was a huge contact between Parthia and the Armenians. Look at the map. They're next door to each other. Both of them had common gods. Professor James Russell has written many, many articles about the Armenian Zoroastrianism in Armenia. Zoroastrianism was big, also Hellenism was big. Hellenic gods and Zoroastrian gods, both were in Armenia and in Parthia. And especially Hellenic gods after Alexander the Great, more and more Hellenic gods were in this area, and both of them had different temples to them. Once Rome penetrated the area, it was to Roman advantage to create little countries in that area to challenge the rising power of the Parthians. And a year later, in some historians say two years later, Rome recognized one of the generals of the area, known as Artashes, as king. Artashes became the first Armenian king with an Armenian crown, a different crown, the same crown you see Tigran has. It's known as the Armenian diadem or the Armenian tiara with different eagles, etc. on it. It doesn't look like any other crown. Artashes started minting coins because without coins you don't have a government. It's the first time Armenia has coins with a picture of the Armenian king on one side. On the other side, usually a Hellenistic goddess, goddess of fortune, etc., written in Greek. Basileus Tigranes, Tigran the king, or so forth. Always in Greek, because the language was, at that time, after Alexander the Great, Greek was used on the coins. 